Live from the Talking Joe Studios, it's Talking Joe. G.I. Joe, the very best, America's elite. Elite than all the rest, trained to have no flaws. Defending liberty across the land, valor oversized. Bring out that big brass band, real heroes verified. Gotta read them all, you must agree. Elitist in history, G.I. Joe, oh there could be no end, in a world we must defend, G.I. Joe, gotta read the a courageous crew, their colours red, white and blue, mess with them and they'll shoot you, G.I. Joe, gotta read them all, gotta read them all. Hey, 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 it's me, Mark, and you are listening to Talking Joe, the G.I. Joe Comics podcast. If you want to find out more about who we are, what we're all about, you can go over to the website, talkingjoe.co.uk. It has all about us and links to various places that we are, etc. So you are joining us back in the world of Devil's Jew. So... If you're a long-term listener, you will know that we've been doing a massive deep dive into the Devil's Due era of G.I. Joe, uh, which started back in 2001. And we've been calling those episodes Talking Joe Disavowed. Today, we are back in that world and we are covering G.I. Joe Special Missions, the enemy from Devil's Due, out in September 2007. So this is the fifth and final special missions one shot from uh, that era. And you can only find it as a single issue or online if you look hard enough. Uh, And it's never been reprinted. Uh, So it's one of those rare issues from that era that only exists as uh, as a floppy issue, at least for now, until Skybound finally get around to covering the Devil's Due era in a massive compendium, which uh, who knows when that will be. Okay, I've spoken long enough by myself. Uh, Let's hear another voice. That voice will be my co-host. It's a real American, Tim. It's Tim Finn. Hello, Mark. And hello, (laughs) listeners. Listeners? And hello, listeners. Sorry, it's September 2007, and something's going wrong with some Cobra agents. Are you doing Doc Brown from Back to the... Marty! We gotta go back to the future! I was uh, remarking that we have been reading so many issues in the Energon universe and in the A Real American Hero, Larry Hama universe, that it has been many months since we talked about a Devil's Stew issue or story for this podcast. And I felt when I sat down to read this comic that in some ways the pressure was off because... There's so much momentum with the Energon universe and also with the Real American Hero universe. And, Uh you know, just two years ago, there was no Energon universe. And all we had were, you know, we did a bunch of episodes on uh, Devil's Due Mm -hmm. because uh, Real American Hero was either in its year off between publishers or only one issue every four weeks. And so to keep this podcast going roughly weekly, we were really digging back into the 2000s, which was great. And momentarily, we thought we were going to run out of Devil's Due material really fast. And now we have this influx of Energon Universe comics. And, you know, surely some of our Devil's Due fan listeners have been wondering when we'd get back to Devil's Due. And uh, we, we happen to have sort of a week off where there isn't an issue of, you know, Real American Hero or Destro or Scarlet uh, to talk about. And we're not at a convention or, you know, both on vacation and taking the week off. And this Devil's Due episode lands on a single issue, not a story arc. And it's not a first issue or a last issue. It's just a one shot. It's 48 pages. It has two stories. Uh, the cover also tells me it has nonstop action. And <laughs> and I thought, 
what a night, you know, every episode of G.I. Joe is some kind of change of pace. Sometimes it's an interview. Sometimes we're, you know, talking about an oversized first issue. Sometimes we're talking about a four issue arc and that this one is self-contained and not as high profile as the main issues of Devil's Do uh, feels like a little more relaxed, you know, yeah. and and not like, oh, I'm out of practice. How do I talk about Devil's Do? But oh, yeah, Devil's <laughs> Do, let's talk about Devil's Do. So to be honest, though, Tim, so it's been a little while. So the momentum, the momentum was off because we were covering the, the main storylines. Then we sort of paused for all of these sort of one shots and, and the Transformers crossovers. So it's been a little while since we, we've been talking about that main Devil's Due continuity. So I sort of did have to get myself back in that headspace and kind of uh, recenter myself in, in, the, uh, in the Devil's Due continuity. Yes, fortunately, there are two footnotes in this issue. And there's also some annotations at the end of the first story, which I actually have to say disappoint me because I thought I was being very clever by knowing the stories that were being <laughs> referred to. And I was going to look really impressive uh, on this episode. And then I got to the last page and I thought, oh, they just tell us all the stories. That this <laughs> well, to. everyone can understand this now. That's no fun. <laughs> uh, I know, but if, if they can listen to the episode, then they'll understand. Mm. So, yeah, we're, we're sort of covering the last of the special missions uh, one shots there's there was five in all the the first four were relating to a country so antarctica tokyo brazil and uh, new york i think it was this this is just called the enemy and uh, as this is published we're we're just uh, sort of in in the main series in world war 3 we're gearing up to it so but it's a good break point before we get into the uh, Mark Powers run, because in, in terms of publishing order, this, this appears slightly uh, later on. But in terms of storyline, this very much uh, is tied to a, a, an event that, that sort of catapults the, the story forward uh, in the next four-parter, which is Sins of the Mother in, in the main uh, America's Elite book. Which which we have not talked about on this podcast. That that will be our that will be our next regular uh, Devil's Do episode. And then following that, twelve issues of World War Three, which is the end point to the Devil's Do run. So the end is in sight. Uh, yeah, should we talk about the cover to the book? Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. <laughs> This issue has only one cover. There was no variant cover. Or, or was there no variant cover, Tim? Or was there was there a G.I. Joe Collectors Club convention exclusive cover? Oh, which okay. Was, I want you for Cobra the Enemy. Oh, just the poster by itself? Okay, very good. Uh, the, the website that I'm looking at that sells many, many, many old and new comics and always has a cover. That's generally where I look. And it does not list that variant, but it is almost always right in the variants it lists. So uh, the regular cover is uh, drawn by uh, Kalman Andrasovsky and colored by Jean-Francois Bilyeu. The the cover artist who signs his work, uh, Kalman, has done work for um, Marvel and I think uh, DC. This is, this is the James Montgomery flag painted image of Uncle Sam pointing, I want you. Uh, a recruitment poster from 1917. Yes, thank you for World War One. Uh, in this case, it's hooded Cobra Commander, and the image is a brick wall with at least six of these posters plastered on them. One of them is mostly front and center. It's a little frayed on the bottom. There's a trash can on the bottom left, uh, and there's a young boy with a slingshot and a backpack and. We see him from behind and he's looking up at this poster and he's got a t-shirt and he looks like he could be anyone. This is not a specific person in the world of G.I. Joe. This is not a specific kid. This is any kid seeing this bit of uh, propaganda. And uh, the top left of the cover has a cast shadow on it. So some of these posters kind of disappear and the, the logo and some of the copy get to um, pop out. The color here is all a bit desaturated and uh, the paper of the poster looks weathered uh, and it's a the G.I. Joe logo up top is um, 
slightly at an angle, and then the subtitle of it, The Enemy, is on the very bottom of the cover. And this is a good cover because it, in a very general sense, represents the issue without depicting a specific scene from the issue. And it's sometimes fun when a cover can be more empirical or symbolic. Mm. Uh, This is also a cover that we've sort of never seen in G.I. Joe. We have seen, you know, uh, Joes and Cobras in battle, someone running or flying or, you know, an explosion. We've seen a bunch of Joes or a bunch of Cobras standing there being very cool. We have seen some close-up portraits. We've seen maybe one or two of them up close kind of grappling with each other. Um, We've almost never seen a cover where the sort of second most important character is just some kid. And then this sort of this well-known iconic bit of American history has been co-opted by Cobra. You know, sort of the the closest thing to this is like uh, the shot from the live action G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra, when you see the White House in Washington, D.C. and Cobra banners are being dropped in front of it because it's been, you know, taken over by Sartan. Um, the text on this uh, sort of echoes that that famous Uncle Sam recruitment poster. Uh, I want you for the U.S. Army nearest recruiting recruiting station. And that t- smaller text is replaced with the great snake rules forever. Recognize that uh, that phraseology, Tim? Yeah, Shipwreck and Polly say that in the third G.I. Joe animated miniseries that aired in the fall of 85 to get out of a security death trap. Hail Cobra, the great snake rules forever. Hail Cobra. And then Polly says it and somehow Polly's Ah, voice matches. Cobra Commander, the great snake lives forever. (laughs) Right. Uh, So good, good cover. (laughs) And did you know, Tim, Hmm. that the Uncle Sam sort of poster, famous poster, was an homage in itself to the Lord Kitchener Wants You poster from 1914, uh, three years previous. I did that. not know that. Uh, who is Lord, who's Lord Kitchener? Is that, is that a he British person? He was the British Secretary uh, of State for War at the time. So he okay. was dressed as a British field master, uh, pointing in a similar way uh, and uh, encouraging the, the British to, to sort of sign up to the army. I'm reminded for those of you that have the uh, James Montgomery flag, Uncle Sam character in your head that the uh, Steve Darnall, Alex Ross, DC Vertigo, Uncle Sam graphic novel from 25 years ago is coming back into print uh, in a few months. Um, I think it's published by Clover now, not by, not by DC. Uh, not related to G.I. Joe. <laughs> and funnily enough, in a in a nice bit of uh, sort of coincidence, this "I Want You for Cobra" is very timely because just uh, you know a little a little earlier, uh, Hasbro dropped a teaser poster for their Haslab twenty twenty four, which has a regal classified Cobra commander pointing at us in a very similar way with the slogan "I Want You." Imagine that. This is the kind of image that we will see recur in in G.I. Joe iconography uh, without people making reference to any of these later references. You know, HasLab reference is not a reference to this Devil's Due issue. It's it's a reference to the original, original poster. And you see it in other media as well. Um, There was an early Transformers promotional image when IDW uh, got the license uh, for late 2005 or early 2006 of Optimus Prime with a white background in this same pointing pose by uh, the artist Milks, M-I-L-X. Uh, let's get back to, let's get back to G.I. Joe Special Missions, The Enemy, Mark. Yeah. What? Well, let's, should we start right at the very, very back of the book? Is there another link to this I Want You for Cobra image? Yeah. I'm always tickled when the ads in a single issue comic book the old ads remind me of what else was happening in comics and in the world and that might be an ad for like you know back issue mail order or an upcoming other project from the publisher and in this case um, it is an ad for the 2007 
G.I. Joe convention. Uh, and the image is Baroness in a Hector Garrido style, but not the original Hector Garrido painting. And uh, this is her crimson, what's it called, when she and Tomax and Zamot were redone in red. Uh, so this is the Baroness, um, but she's not pointing. Uh, she's holding a pistol and not quite pointing. But um, anyway, and, and, the, and there's, there's a white background uh, and it says, I want you. Be there for all the excitement as we celebrate 25 years of G.I. Joe versus Cobra action. It's a once in a lifetime weekend you won't want to miss. Space is limited. And then there's the website. And then there are a couple bursts, you know, seminars and panels. Meet Larry Hama, exclusive convention figures, 47 story parachute drop. And this convention was at the Marriott Marquis in Atlanta, Georgia. I did not attend this convention, but one, seeing this just sort of makes me happy because some people did and I'm sure had a great time. <laughs> and two, this reminds me that for the Devil's Due Years, the official fan club, the collector's club, and the official collector's convention, we're doing these ads in the Devil's Due book. And that is a bit of cross-promotional synergy that makes total sense and I really appreciate. And I would love to see, you know, like, I don't think we saw that in the IDW G.I. Joe there weren't ads for this other stuff that was happening. Mm. All right. So that's, that's the inside back cover of special missions, the enemy. Okay. Let's so, so this uh, comic is divided into two stories. The, the main, the bulk of which is special missions, the enemy uh, with a second backup, uh, the grading curve. So let's sort of tackle them in two parts. The enemy uh, comes to us from script, Andrew Dabb. Line art by Vincente Cifuentes. Uh, color art, Andrew Dalhouse. Uh, interesting, they, call, they describe it line art and color art rather than penciler and colorist. Uh, so, you know, possibly uh, possibly to reflect the, that maybe there's uh, slightly different elements of effort from uh, the colorist than, than a normal issue. Uh, lettering, Brian J. Crowley. Editor Mike O'Sullivan with a tip of the hat to Larry Harmer. The the name Vincente Cifuentes doesn't necessarily mean an awful lot to me. I don't know that he's done very much, Joe, uh, but uh, it looks like he's done a lot of work. Uh, Comic Vine has him listed with almost 500 credits, uh, but does him, have him as an Inca. So uh, presumably uh, he kind of pivoted his career to uh, to focus more on inking rather than necessarily pencils. At his own website, uh, he says he was born in 79. He's Spanish. I started working for the American market in 2005. Uh, I have inked uh, artists like Artie NCF, Joe Bennett, Ivan Rice, Jesus Marino. I, I have seen this name on a lot of DC books in the last 15 years, you know, Wonder Woman and Green Lantern and some Batman projects. But I, I don't have a strong link with him or any uh, for G.I. Joe. Okay, let's, uh, let's have a quick summary of the plot. Plot, plot breakdown. breakdown. In two parallel concurrent stories, we follow G.I. Joe Grunt's path from high school to the army, to G.I. Joe, to civilian life, and back to G.I. Joe again. And in the parallel story, we follow a Viper through his recruitment to Cobra, covering training, battles with G.I. Joe, and finding his way to the end of the story back in jail. Both stories end as they advise on recruiting people to their cause, saying it was the best decision I ever made. Tim, where would you like to start? So uh, we have seen this kind of uh, storytelling before in the world of uh, G.I. Joe in issues, uh, is it 124 and 125? The story is Triptych uh, and Diptych, uh, where on each page, something is happening in one place with one set of characters, and it is paralleled in the other panel or panels on that same page with other characters in another place. And in this case, it's more of a mirror image. Good things are happening to the character on top and bad things are happening to the character on bottom. Yeah, it's, it's 
you know, a very, uh, they've done this in a very structured way through the issue. So, so the, each page is sp effectively split in two. The grunt story is, is being told on the top half of the page, uh, with the Viper story being told on the bottom half. And broadly speaking, it, you know, they're in a similar sort of place, um, in their lives on, on, the, on each page where they're, you know, they're, they've lost a, a parent. They've uh, they're going through training. They're you know taking part in a battle. That that kind of thing, and it's the different experience that they're having on on in in their life, uh, you know, and in Cobra versus in GI Joe uh, points. Uh, and on three pet specific pages of the story, the, the kind of the story links up where they're in the same space at the same time before they sort of then. Uh, you know, divert again. So that's uh, the point where there's uh, they meet in and in, in the characters in the story they meet during the invasion of Springfield. You know, from issue forty nine fifty, uh, and then again uh, on Cobra Island for for Devil's Dues uh, Civil War story. I, I like this first story. I don't love the art. Um, mm. Cifuentes is uh, talented, but I think. This art really wants an anchor, whether or not mm. he is mostly an anchor and occasionally a penciler or not. This style of pencils that are a little light and not very dark, uh, and there are a lot of lines that I wish were A, darker, and B, thicker. The color doesn't overpower them, but it's starting to. Uh, and my example is page uh, 12, panel 3 when uh, Grunt helps the other guy up in the um, the mud. They're in training, uh, and there's, there's a camo pattern on both of their shirts, and there's a subtle but very real highlight and sort of mid-tone on like, all of their skin, their forehead, their neck, their arms, and also their camo, and their camo is busy, and the mud behind them has like highlights and a bit of shadow. And this panel just needs black ink to help anchor it. it it all sort of like floating apart and like f sort of flying off the page in in different um uh directions to me it's like it's like disassociating but uh Cifuentes is drawing different faces for different characters which is nice he's not just drawing stock faces you know his body language and his layouts are good there are a couple poses here and there that are and compositions that are that are weak, but um, his storytelling is clear, and I think overall this story works really well, even if the art and the color are uh, a bit of a misfire. And I have always wondered how any one particular Joe gets selected or chooses to try out for GI Joe, and th this one doesn't feel canon to me because it's it's a Devil Stew story. It's not. It's not a real American hero story, a Larry Hama story, um, but I do like it. And the stuff with this guy on the bottom, this 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 Cobra guy who becomes a Cobra soldier. Who is unnamed through the whole story. Yes, he doesn't end up being anyone that we know. It's not actually like, you know, scrap iron or, you know, tombstone. I do think there's a slight misfire here in that the the cobra guy who maybe i'll just call the enemy for the whole story mm -hmm. page one and page two uh i think he's supposed to look really tired and bedraggled because he has been drinking and because he's down on his luck uh, but in terms of his actual face he just also looks five or ten years too old yeah. for me to quite buy what happens in the story and i do think that cobra in a real world, would recruit not just, you know, 18-year-olds and 22-year-olds, but I, I feel like he just needs to be younger for sort of all the um, the sort of physical stuff that he's going to be doing. And also the parallel to, to Grunt, where it's called out specifically that he's kind of dropping out of college to um, support his family. So he's meant to be of a college age. And I think this, this uh, enemy... Is, is meant to kind of be in a similar sort of place of, of hit as him, so you know, similar sort of age. Although his stepmother looks very, very old. <laughs> yeah, I actually feel like Graves here is is sort of not like 19 or 20. I feel like 
based on how he's drawn, he might have gone to college a little later. But, you know, I also sort of the age of any one G.I. Joe character has always been a little mysterious to me. And I think my brother tried to explain some of this to me when we were younger because he was reading a lot of military stuff uh, like, you know, Black Hawk Down or real missions that Navy SEALs go on. You know, Navy SEALs aren't 18 and they're not 22. They are older because they've done a lot more schooling and a lot more training and they've and they're a lot wiser. Um, so. A lot of the Joes are not like 23 and 24. Anyway, um, there was a storytelling scene that I, I needed some help with. And I wanted to I wanted to ask you about it, Mark, on page uh, 16. This is this is where the top this is a right page. This is where the top of it is um, Stalker saying to a mission accomplished. And they're sitting down. And then on the bottom, it's the card game. Uh, at some Cobra location with a bunch of Cobra soldiers in, in um, you know, out of uniform and tank tops. So the enemy is on the right and someone we can't see, and he's watching the card game from a distance. And then someone says, who's in shadow says, hey friend, come on over to the table. You want to get dealt in? And then there's two hands on his shoulder and he says, hey, and then someone goes, ah, and then the enemy says, touch me again and I'll rip off your hand. I'm not here to make friends. And he's tossing, I guess, the the beer he was drinking two panels ago. And he's turned around and now he's like leaving the room with the card game. And one of the guys at the card game says, what a jerk. And then there is someone standing behind him on the right. So what happened here? Yeah, I don't know. It's not very clear, is it? It feels like there's maybe something missing, like a... a, a an action missing between him having a hand on his shoulder, like sort of maybe sort of, you know, putting someone, putting their hand on his shoulder, kind of to usher him over to join in the game of cards. And he goes, Hey, and then maybe shoves the person away or, you know, punches them or something. I don't know. Uh, and then, and then sort of walks off, touch me again. I'll rip you off your hand. Yeah. It feels like there's something missing, but with the beat where he says, Hey, and then the, other person is already sort of screaming. I thought, oh, is someone else beating up the person who dares lay a hand on the enemy? Like the guy all the way on the right in the final panel. But that guy isn't properly introduced in the scene, the the black guy in the white tank top. So I couldn't follow this. <laughs> I, I In broad yeah. strokes, I understood it because of the dialogue. But in terms of staging, I, I can't actually follow it. Yeah. Um, I just did a quick Google. So... Um... Uh, talking about the sort of college age i did a, so grunt is from columbus ohio and it talks about him playing um for west so i'm guessing that that refers to west high school um varsity football uh for columbus ohio so uh presumably hinting that he's indicate i'm not a high school or college football you know expert but but is that kind of suggesting that maybe he was playing high school football? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in which case he's even younger because he's, yeah. He's, right. Uh, right. About, because they're saying you, you're going to have to put off college. So he's maybe coming to the end of his time yeah. at high school. Yeah. This is eight playing for varsity football at high school, looking forward to college. So he quits the football team, maybe keeps in school for a little bit longer, but is like using the hours that he would have been playing football to kind of do some extra work or something. Yeah. Uh, two more things in the art. One one that I like. This is actually in the letter. Let's talk about SFX, baby. Let's talk about pew and scree. Let's talk about shooting gun things and the sound effects. We'll see. Let's talk about SFX. Let's talk about SFX. On page seven, uh, the uh, there's a police car, and it has a sound effect. Uh, we re, and it is colored red and white, and then blue and white, and then red and white to allude to the red and white of the flashing sirens on the police car. And uh, uh, Devil's Due G.I. Joe comic may have done this before, and I have forgotten, but I like this. On the next page, there's a bit of art that I don't especially like. I don't think I don't think uh, he's got to grips with drawing um, hard hats very well. They don't look right. <laughs> mm. It looks like it looks like he's on a laboring on a building building site, 
wearing a lab coat and uh, a weird hard hat and specifically on this next panel here sort of holding a sledgehammer but in a very kind of awkward way with the sledgehammer looking quite diddy as as well um so uh, yeah he's, he's new, this this artist is new in his career yeah he, he's not getting everything completely right i think he's uh, some of some of the art is is not looking as good as it could have been because it's missing the the inks to tighten things up and you know create planes and 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 embedded in that is the assumption that it would be a very good inker who understands light and shadow and weight and anatomy and could very slightly improve uh, many aspects of this without you know a lot of redrawing or without yeah. any redrawing. But um, all, all that said, I don't th- I don't think the storytelling necessarily suffers too too much. That it's it's pretty clear for most of yeah. what's going on. Um, there are two there are happening. two last bits in the art um, that I'm just gonna uh, pick on. Um, one is the final panel of page 18, where um, it's, we're in the Battle of Springfield, and uh, the 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 enemy orders some Cobra soldiers ahead, and then he shoots the televiper who stays behind, so he can sneak away. And in that final panel, he's climbing through a window to get away, and. Sifuentes and the colorist just stop drawing and coloring uh, the enemy's <laughs> leg. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, a couple pages later, uh, at one of these moments of convergence, Grunt and the enemy are fighting. There's there's a tackle and a punch. And I think this is in the writing, maybe not in the art. Grunt punches the enemy in the side of the helmet and the helmet shatters. And also his face mask tears. And um, yeah, those Cobra helmets made by the cheapest bidder. <laughs> you, know. you know, I think when Optimus Prime punches Megatron, some of Megatron's sort of head helmet can crack and maybe some pieces can fly off, but uh, maybe not for Joe's. But uh, again, I, I, I do, I do want to say that I appreciate um, Sifuentes' drawing these very specific faces and uh, drawing facial anatomy with some care. He's still got a ways to go, but he's he's doing it with uh, by with with some attention and all of his expressions. He's he's making a lot of effort at facial acting. I thought the most interesting thing about this this story, which is kind of a bit of a jaunt through GI Joe history, it's sort of before uh, before Grunt has joined GI Joe with GI Joe issue one. You know, we, we do see uh, some of the events of of uh, issue one and some of the other kind of points in in gi joe history leading up to kind of in inverted commas today uh or 2007 um so that is uh interesting but um it, it's it's a, it's a sort of story that that i'd you know at around this time been thinking a lot about and and the kind of story that i'd like to see which is the kind of slightly more character focused kind of ground up view a character centric story where maybe we're, we're focusing on a key character through a sweep of G.I. Joe history or, you know, an unnamed, you know, Cobra join, joining up and what is their motivations for, for joining and, and how, how does it, how, what, what is life like as a, you know, as a sort of a, a grunt for Cobra, as it were, a, a, a you know, a regular old Cobra uh, soldier. And I don't, don't think it's necessarily executed in, in kind of the way that, you know, I, w- I would have wanted that story to be be, be told, but um, it's sort of like um, some of the uh, um, uh, Kurt Busiek type writing on on Astro City, or you know on Marvels, where where you're seeing kind of that um, uh, you know observer's view of this uh, grand and exciting kind of world sort of going on, going on around you, and what's it what's it like being at the bottom of the chain? in that in that world when you say marvels you mean the kurt busiek alex ross painted mini series from the 90s yes i agree i have always wanted a a story in gi joe continuity particularly from that guy who's written the most gi joe comics but wasn't really working much at devil's do about just how a person becomes a cobra hmm. and there's a deke episode about how just a, a kid gets uh, becomes a viper and it's pretty silly um <laughs> but 
because this idea that, you know, in the real American hero of continuity and therefore the devils do continuity, Cobra Commander is this, you know, used car salesman, this pyramid scheme, this domestic terrorist, and he's giving speeches and getting disaffected Americans on his side. And, you know, then he sort of races this army and, you know, links up with Destro and gets armament. I would love a story of, you know, just one particular every person who gets um, swept up in that and and how it happens in the same way that uh, what's the marvel issue uh it's in the 80s it's got doesn't it have repeater on the cover uh and a viper is about to stab him from behind at yeah, night it's, it's a Ron, rog magner cover 80 i don't know 82 or something and isn't that the issue where uh hama shows several almost joes become become joes and the rest wash out and that issue always left me wanting more. Mm. And that was a way for him to tell that kind of story and also introduce a couple new characters because, mm. you know, every year he had not introduced 25 new characters. There is an interview at CBR, uh, which f- formerly has stood for Comic Book Resources and maybe still technically does, um, <laughs> from 2007, uh, an article, I should say, uh, from from a Dave Richards uh, with some quotes from Andrew Dabb uh, about this story and with um, Mike O'Sullivan. And Mike O'Sullivan says, I've always wondered where they come from, all these guys in Cobra Blue. How did Cobra Commander get so many people to follow him? It seemed like a story that's needed to be told for a long time. Mark Powers, Josh Blalock, and I have talked about it on off and on for a few years. And when we next... And when we had the next special missions on the schedule, I pushed for the story to be told uh, in its pages. After tossing ideas around with Andrew Dabb, we both figured it needed a point-to-counterpoint approach, so we opted to bring the most prominent green shirt into the mix and decided to tell Grunt's story alongside the Cobras. The format was greatly inspired by a Fantastic Four story by John Byrne. And then Andrew Dabb adds... Yeah, Mike recommended I read that John Byrne Fantastic Four issue, and I was just amazed at how much he was able to fit into 20-something pages. Uh, And then the writer of the article says, the main story was originally to be a 10-page backup in America's Elite 25. And then Dab says, the more Mike and I talked, the more it became obvious we had way more than 10 pages worth of ideas. So in the end, it was decided that a longer Special Missions one-shot was the way to go. I would have loved to have had something in issue 25, at the same time, I'm really glad the story got the space it needed to breathe. Very good. My my sort of final sort of thoughts uh, about you know perhaps why maybe this doesn't quite hit with me as may, maybe much as I would have liked it to is that perhaps it's a little bit simplistic. We sort of go through the story, and there there's not too much of a kind of up and down to it. It's Grunt is a great guy. And the unnamed Viper is a bit of an arsehole. Uh, <laughs> and that's the way it is through uh, through from start to finish. I think possibly a slightly more interesting story would would be, uh, you know, someone that's a little bit more relatable, a little bit, you know, p- perhaps uh, someone uh, who considers themselves to be a good person, but through, um, you know, difficult circumstances find themselves you know, being lured into into cobra you know whether that's to get insurance for their family as as larry as 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 larry hammer has previously hinted at in in one of his stories or or something else yeah i can see your point um i uh, i don't mind that this cobra guy is just it's just a bad crummy guy all through and through because i feel like you know maybe half of all of cobra are like this and then half them you know are good people who are down on their luck and get 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 taken in um Mm. but i i take your point that maybe it's a little too uh a little too on the nose uh and then there's a source guide at the back which kind of fills in all the blanks of kind of what all of the moments in history are and who the characters are that that are sort of being featured as in this sort of sweep uh, from uh, the the two characters' younger years through to sort of modern times, and and it sort of did help explain something for me, which was I thought I saw a potential, you know, error or or sort of gap, which uh, which was just about uh, Vance Wingfield 
uh, who was there as the Cobra trainer. And I thought to myself, is was from uh, G.I. Joe 4, was he actually a Cobra trainer? And uh, I went back to the issue. The In the issue itself, the, the mission for, for the Joes is to go and look into Vance Wingfield to see if there was any direct, if there was any Cobra involvement. And I don't think that was ever quite resolved. I don't know that there was ever quite um, a link back to Cobra in that issue that was nailed down. So I guess it was sort of left as an open uh, you know, question or potential. But in Snake Eyes Declassified, it was more uh, concretely confirmed that he trained the Cobra army. So um, in the Devil's Due continuity, at least, he... Uh, was more linked to Cobra. And in the Devil's Due continuity, is there a story in G.I. Joe Frontline with Wingfield's son? Am I remembering right. yep. that we've talked about? And also Wingfield's wife? Yep. And then he appears himself in uh, the beginning of America's Elite, of course. In right. Wheelchair. Right. There was also, I sort of chuckled at this because we were looking at Paul, how Paul Pelletier had been drawing the Cobra infantry in the pages of uh, ARA recently and noting that they sort of had those in the uh, year kind of in the year 2024 in the year 2024 and that he had sort of drew them with those kind of um, shoulder pads you know that kind of almost uh, leather kind of ribbing padding on, on their on the shoulders and noting that that wasn't part of the original design but but was sort of something that featured in classified, but also in these uh, Devil's Due era, era um, issues. And, and so they sort of do kind of retcon those to it being part of the uh, the design that features here when uh, the, the Viper joins up. Uh, any other any other thoughts for this first? Yeah, there's a lot of Vice Spies here, but I think it's there's so many that it's, it's almost redundant to go through them. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a sweep of G.I. Joe history with lots of uh, appearances. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing too crazy to, to call out. Three, twenty-four, twenty-five. It's twenty-five pages plus the uh, plus the annotations. Uh, should we get to the next one? Yes. So the next one is the grading curve, which is a prologue to World War Three. The grading curve is brought to us by creators, uh, writer, editor, Mike O'Sullivan, penciler, Mike Getty, colorist, Bob Pedroza, letterer, Brian J. Crowley, military advisor, Phil Cost, with thanks to Mark Powers. That thank you being that this uh, particular prologue story ties into World War Three, the story that Mark Powers is writing as a as a bit of uh before we get into it as a bit of context let's place ourselves back in the devil's due history um in america's elite issue 16 a cobra commander found out about baroness's baby uh, when he was um operating as uh the president's right hand man and getting all of that access to sort of uh, classified information um and in then in issue 18 uh, there is a mission led by Blackout that delivers Baroness's baby to Cobra Commander. So this particular story sort of uh, fills out the, some of the details of what happened in that mission uh, that Blackout led to deliver the baby to Cobra Com Commander. So here's the details. Uh, no, so here's a summary of that in a plot breakdown. Plot breakdown. <laughs> Blackout leads a group of Cobra soldiers on a deadly mission to capture the Baroness's baby from a medical center in Lincoln, Nebraska, and to kill all witnesses. In addition to Blackout, the team consists of a Cobra eel named Guillotine, former Night Creeper leader Aleph, Munisha, Sky Creeper, Interrogator, and His Tank Captain Rippet. As he evaluates his team, Blackout decides that by questioning their orders, Rippet and the Sky Creeper should be executed. Later, Cobra Commander decides that he now has a complete team selected from the ranks of different Viper specialities and will activate a new unit containing them, named The Plague. To be continued in the pages of America's Elite World War III. But first, in talking joe we are going to talk about sins of the mother and then we'll get to world war three mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, an interesting part about this story was uh, an element that uh, Mike O'Sullivan helped uh, sort of clarify for us, which was essentially, um, you know, the these two cobras, Rippet and the Sky Creeper, kind of seem to be freaked out a little bit by uh, taking a a baby, but fairly happy with you know killing all of those other civilians and and perhaps the their, their reaction. And the uh, the reaction in terms of their execution seems a little bit uh, wonky in some way. And uh, Mike O'Sullivan helped explain why that was, that originally uh, they were due to kill all of the babies and just take uh, the Baroness's baby. So uh, let's just play that clip where he explains that. Uh, I wanted to push the envelope a little bit and really establish Cobra Commander and the Plague as just vile villains so in the special missions the enemy i wrote a backup story that was actually the prologue to world war three uh where cobra commander is recruiting the last of the uh the plague characters and in that story i looked at it again last night it just seems like okay two characters that were sent on this mission to steal duster and baroness's baby are balking at them kidnapping a baby and I tried to make it as big of a deal as possible that they questioned Cobra Commander's orders. And so they, Cobra Commander had been killed in the original story. They were balking at the plague, killing all of the babies that were in the nursery. Once they got Cobra Commander's baby out of there, because I really wanted it to be vile. I wanted it. I wanted Cobra Commander before this world war three story and the plague to be set up as I mean, what what worse could a villain do? Seriously. And so I really wanted that. Hasbro rightfully said no. It was off panel. It was off panel. You didn't see it. You just heard, you just saw a, a sound effect of gunshots. But it was a step too far. Rightfully so. But I really wanted Cobra Commander to be evil. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an example of where they came back and they were like, uh-uh, no, can't do that. So we worked the world... Reworked the story a little bit that they weren't protesting the babies being killed, just protesting the kidnapping of a baby. And it was their going against Cobra Commander's orders that got them killed rather than them trying to stop the murders. Thank you, Mike, for explaining that background for um, for this issue. Tim, what were your main thoughts about this one? I love that several obscure characters who either had never shown up or had only shown up briefly show up here. I appreciate that though the artwork is pencils only, either through sort of quote digital inking or just more work done at the pencil stage. But if you squint, it just looks like it's been inked that there Mm. aren't these sort of uh, sort of very, very, very light lines and then very light lines but instead, there is a lot of spotted black in this. So the, the art and the color together hang together a lot better. I do like the coloring here more. It's it's more sort of, you know, traditional um, uh, primaries, uh, a lot less sort of desaturated pastels. There's, there's too much white mixed into all the colors in the lead story in this comic book. And this one is just a lot more uh, hue of each color. And I like that the Cobras are doing some terrible things. They're stealing a baby and they're killing bystanders and a couple of them kill each other. And Cobra Commander says to do all this. So in this story, he's a really bad guy. But um, all of that said, uh, I also like uh, the the bits of narration from Blackout. Blackout is narrating the story, right? Yes. Yes. I also appreciate all the narration that describes these different characters. And even though they're all sort of bad guys who do bad things, there's a lot of differentiation between them. All of that said, the art is good, but it's still not quite there. Mike Getty is not someone that I'm familiar with uh, in comics. I think later uh, he did some work at Marvel and he did some pinups for devils do in the gi joe data desk handbook but i think this is his only significant uh, gi joe uh, work in terms of the story i see a bunch of vehicle drivers and specialists 
I see two his tank drivers and an air commando and a ninja and a cobra eel, an underwater frogman guy. And they don't do any of that stuff. There are no his tanks in this story. No one's ever underwater or sort of even shows up for one panel dripping wet like, oh, I just got here from the um, <laughs> harbor. Uh, let's kill some babies. Uh, yeah, the eel is in his sort of frogman suit throughout, right? <laughs> right. Um, and and the ninja doesn't really do anything ninja-y. And so I, I, halfway through the story, I thought, okay, I do like this story. And I'm always thrilled to see you know, like an obscure vehicle driver, like Rip It, or uh, who? Who's the who's the blue and yellow guy? Uh, Sky Creeper is it? Sky Creeper. I love that. But what I realized halfway through the story is that it doesn't really read like a GI Joe story because it doesn't have that other half of GI Joe, which is um, vehicles, which are our characters, <laughs> or. The sort of specialty of let's like, well, this person has a blow tor- uh, has a flamethrower, so they're going to deal with this part of the mission. It's like, no, they just all show up and shoot people. And so then I thought, well, then they're all sort of interchangeable, despite several pages of really fun. It's almost too much if you if you squint and look at the page, the the pages of uh, narration where all these caption boxes are red and white. There's a gradient. It's like, oh, that's a lot to read on some of these pages. So I like this story. I don't love this story. Um, I do think the bit at the end with Cobra Commander and and how two of the members of this team don't get to stay on this team, I thought that's a, a cool twist. Um, but, you know, if, if we're going to have a, a, a Cobra Eel, I, I need them to do a Cobra Eel-ish thing. And you can write it out. You can say, it's like, oh, well, Rip It, you know, was a, a his tank driver and Munitia was a his tank driver or his tank commander and you know sky creeper international thief currently a cobra air recon patrol leader glider pilot and it's like how about a panel of him showing up in that fun silly dumb vehicle and then he can shoot some you know hospital people <laughs> yeah i mean um when when you said it's sort of missing one half of GI Joe, um, I thought I thought that the uh, the other half was going to be GI Joe characters uh, because this is an all Cobra um, uh, story, which I guess ties in with the story uh, with the the title, the enemy. But but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting to see a story that is very Cobra centric, focused on on their side of the the story, and um, you know is there to set up these guys as as a badass team that we'll see uh, more of uh, down the road do you want to zoom in on some specifics specifics or do you have any uh uh top down broad no i mean it's reaction? it's yeah it's an interesting it's a different story um it, and it's it's obviously quite dark as well in terms of it you know it's showing cobra to be just about as bad as they they ever get because this is an attack on uh a, you know civilian medical center of some sort and, and you know stealing a baby so um you know with potentially some some hints that that some of the you know anyway um but uh i had an ice spy which was uh around munitia because i sort of you know looked her up uh on yojo and uh, she was released by the gi joe collectors club in 2009 this uh cover uh this comic was from 2007 so i thought to myself, oh all right i always always thought it was a a toy that was picked up and used in the comic, but but was it created by the comic and then made into a toy? But what actually happened here was um, was that uh, Munitia was originally scheduled to be released by Hasbro in 2006 as part of a cancelled direct-to-consumer line and was shown um, to the public at Toy Fair in 2006. So images of this character were out there and and I guess it's those uh, images that um, the the Devil's Due guys uh, picked up and thought that this looks like an interesting character to kind of include uh, in our story, in advance of it actually uh, being a released toy. Uh, we should talk about the uh, these other characters who we've never seen or almost never seen. So mm. Blackout, who is narrating the story. Although I got a little confused because. On the second page of this story, in the final two panels, he says, uh, during the initial assault, all candidates performed well. 
at first curious why they were receiving orders from a Cobra frogman. Each mm. quickly fell into line. And that narration box that mentions a Cobra frogman is touching the Cobra eel in that final panel of this second page. And I thought, okay, I'm confused because the, the Caucasian blonde guy who isn't wearing a mask or a helmet who seems to be leading this mission on the splash page. Cobra, attack, he says behind all of them as they break through a wall. And then, Mm -hmm. you have your team assignments. Leave no witnesses. And then on that second page, there's there's a close-up on him. And I think, oh, I think he's in charge. And this Cobra Eel is just sort of one more fun character inclusion uh, in the story. But then I get confused because all these characters here seem to be very specific people. You know, Rippet isn't just one um, his tank driver, he's a very specific his tank, t- tank driver. Mm-hmm. And uh, this Night Creeper leader, even though he's, or Night Creeper, even though he's in the, the general Night Creeper costume, uh, he's the one who got a name. And Munisha is an individual person and, you know, the Sky Commander guy yeah. and the interrogator guy. Okay. So I thought, it, oh, is the that... The eel seems the most generic. Yeah. Is that eel actually one particular eel who, like, might have an eye patch or, like, a goatee? And he's a specific eel, and like he should get a specific name the way that Rippet gets a code name, not like his tank driver number 99B. Um, so I, the, the first two pages confused me with who's in charge of the mission and who's narrating it. And once I kind of figured that out, I thought, cool, but why is there, out of all of these very specific characters, like just a Cobra eel who like doesn't get any sort of specific signifying thing like a scar or an eye patch. He gets a name at the, we find out at the end of the story that he's he's called Guillotine. Okay, right. Okay. But then oh, then he does one then he does some of the murder. Okay. Yeah, so it it sounds like it, it sounds like maybe he's being set up as the the leader of this this team here but with some oversight from Blackout. Uh, Blackout who's a bit more of a kind of a right-hand man, so uh, yeah, they're sort of setting him up as as kind of a, a little bit a little bit of a leadership role. That that when they split up, that he says that he's in he's in charge with uh, Team Omega. So I mean, only you know, only overseeing what you know, three other people or so. But um, right, okay, yeah. all right. S- setting him up as in a bit more of a leadership role. He's the one who comes back to the Cobra base, you know, standing alongside Blackout to report directly to Cobra Commander. And, uh, and yeah, I th- well, without giving things away, we'll he's, see more he's of, gonna be more of this guy. Okay. Yeah, he's going to be someone and not just a generic eel. All right, so I forgot who Blackout was, and a quick trip to the internet reminded me that uh, we've met him before, and this is this story toy invention where there's a Joe and a Cobra who have the same last name, and they're brothers. Mm. And the Joe is Barrel Roll, and the Cobra is Blackout. And they had a subplot over, was it three issues of The Devil's Due? Yeah, spotted about over across a few, few issues in during the, the... In the 20s? Before... Yeah, in the Brandon, in the Brandon Joe uh, issues of um, the, the run. And I appreciate that Barrel Roll, this guy's G.I. Joe brother, doesn't get mentioned here. That Blackout can have a life as a Cobra character separate from this mm-hmm. fun or very forced you pick uh, sort of device of, you know, a Joe and a Cobra are brothers and, you know, there's a misunderstanding and all right. And then, uh, so rip it is uh, a repaint of the original his tank driver. And he came with a repaint of the original his that was released uh, as a Toys R Us exclusive in 99 or 2000. And is, uh, and then uh, you talked about Munisha. So, uh, and then interrogator was, just a figure that did he come with a he battle a, copter yeah he he came with something yeah battle copter that's right yeah in, yeah. in 90 91 or 92 um and that's the kind of character who um because he has a mask i think kids playing with gi joe toys then may have just pretended that there were dozens or hundreds of them like vipers but he has a more specific name and specialty so maybe he's more like major blood or uh blackout he's just one guy yeah and the in the file card seems to suggest that as well uh and then uh sky sky creeper is is the other guys so he was released in 1991 as part of the air commandos with a cobra glider 
quite an out there kind of design, uh, you know, in terms of that bright yellow. I love it. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's the great thing about a story like this is, 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 where, is where they're not just going for the bog standard Cobra characters because there's so many weird and wonderful characters in the G.I. Joe world that have, you know, been created as a toy. That, and a lot of these guys, uh, you know, have, have barely had a panel appearance on in in the comic at all so it's you know it's great that, that they're sort of reaching back and finding these these weird and wonderful characters to include them in some way i've said this before i i i, I think of gi joe and i see gi joe as a brand as color schemes and you know the first year is a lot of blue and a lot of green uh for example and you know sky creeper you know, he's got a sort of a weird helmet and sort of a weird pair of goggles and maybe he's not the coolest and his color scheme, you know, it's aqua and bright yellow. And, you know, he he doesn't work well if he is dropped into G.I. Joe 1984 or G.I. Joe 1986. But by the time you get to 1992, um, he he does fit and and by himself, his color scheme works, you know, blue and yellow and. I, I, I just love seeing him get several panels to do something. Um, I had one more comment about uh, sort of them not doing what their specialty suggests, uh, which is the interrogator doesn't interrogate anyone. And I feel like you could you could throw me a bone. There could be one panel here where he grabs a doctor or a nurse or a secretary and says, you know, where is the maternity ward? And he gets, <laughs> he gets to interrogate someone. I'm going to point out a couple uh, art things. Uh, I'll start on page one. That big panel on the bottom with the doctor and the nurse or the orderly um, getting pushed by the explosion. Something about this panel didn't work for me. And I realized these are superhero poses. These are not civilian, unfair, horrible terrorist attack victim poses that the first two panels of this page are good. Uh, And then the body language in the third panel is like too exciting and too sort of fun considering that these two people are being greatly harmed. And I thought, oh, I wonder if this artist is going to sort of like have the wrong sort of tone for the story, like if it needs to be serious and grave or if it's going to be, you know, fun and poppy. And I think the layouts and the rest of the story are fine. So there isn't that mismatch, but something about that third panel rubbed me the wrong way. And, and I, I found it in, an interesting mismatch. Uh, and then my other sort of art comment is on the fourth page of the story, when Unisha, Blackout, and Sky Creeper are looking through the broken window at all the babies, there's this white shape right behind Unisha. And I thought, what is that? Is that a like a medical device on a cart that like got pushed up against that wall? Well, it's like rounded and sort of organic. Is it like a pile of sheets? And then I realized, I think it's a dead nurse draped mm. over that window. I think that's her butt. Mm. And I thought, You're right. oh, that's that's sort of fun and, and like macabre. Also, like maybe not drawn in such a way that I, I got it. And also, I, I don't think we have to see like someone getting shot in the previous panel in front of that window such that then they can be draped over. But I did wonder what that was initially. Yeah, it's a little bit more macabre than than a giant ice cream cone or something. Uh, yes, I did think like, is that a giant marshmallow? What is that? Very good. Going back to that CBR article, Mike O'Sullivan says of this backup story, I've wanted to tell a story of a more serious nature lately, sort of a complimentary story to Andrews. His story told how a man can get into Cobra. My story tells what someone in Cobra is willing to do in order to get ahead, to get up the ladder. Because it was a villain tale, I want it to be reflective of the dark path they were on. Definitely the least happy story I've ever told. Uh, and then he he points out how there are these obscure characters that we haven't seen before. And uh, one of them is going to be important later on. And then he, he describes his take on, on Cobra Commander. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good, uh, good point there and a, a good theme. It's like, you know, you can be in Cobra, but how bad does that make you where what is your line how far can how how far will you actually go so yeah food for thoughts and then then there are two profiles there are two data desk profiles uh, one of rip it and one of sky creeper and um i don't know if i've made this point in a long time but 
sometimes there's a misconnect between an artist who draws a character in a certain pose, a standing pose or kind of an action like standing pose and the designer who then crops or formats that drawing. And this is a good example where the sky creeper, his left arm is stretched out because he's holding a weapon. Doesn't that toy come with a bow and arrow? Doesn't it come with archery stuff? Isn't that the uh, night vulture? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's the night vulture that comes with a purple crossbow. Okay. So sky, sky creepers left arm is stretched out, but because the space that the profile drawing fits has to be this narrow rectangle. If anything about the pose is sort of more wide, it's going to get cut off. So half of Rippet's AK-47 gets cut off. Not great. All of Skycreeper's arm and half of his leg gets cut off. And there are ways to crop when, you know, you need to crop down on uh, a composition. But there's sort of a rule that you don't crop at... Uh, a joint like wrist, elbow, or shoulder. I remember Bart Sears made that point in an issue of Wizard Magazine in his Brute and Babe column. And I, I wish that the sort of design of these data desk profiles had a little more flexibility, or they were saying to the artists who drew these standing action poses, you know, here's the rectangle, don't violate it too much because we're going to crop harshly. Hmm. It's Yo Joey. Time. Time. Uh, should we give this a score overall now? Yeah, I, I thought. Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was a good issue. I, I like the intent behind it um, of telling some of these different stories. I, I think uh, having that prologue for World War Three was interesting and, and and yeah, quite a um a, a different and jarring uh, Joe story, uh, which which largely uh, worked. I think yeah, some issues with the execution of the of the main story, but overall, you know, it's it's definitely uh, not not bad work overall. So happy enough with the issue overall, I'd say. So yeah, let's give it let's give it a seven. I'm feeling generous. I think the art from these two beginners in their career is okay. I don't like the color in the opening story. Oh, also, I forgot to point out uh, on the while well, I'm picking on the artists. Uh, on the third page of the opening story, uh, there's a coffin next to uh, a hole in the ground at a funeral, and they just walk away from the coffin. And, uh, <laughs> when I have attended funerals, the coffin is lowered into the grave. Yeah. That's that's a very particular moment, and you, you specifically don't leave until that's happened. In terms of writing, he also says, let's get to the real reason we're all here, his will. And the I guess the reading of the will and the funeral are two distinct different events. Um, so, uh, I'm going to give this a five. I think both stories are not quite enhanced by the art, but sort of depicted well enough. And, uh, the first story does a good job and the second story does a, a mixed job. There are things about it that I like, but I do appreciate overall that there, there can be these two Cobra focused stories that, one can tell a story we never maybe knew we wanted or forgot we wanted, and another one can be a specific you know, intro or bridge to an upcoming story that does work on its own. And I appreciate, you know, Devils... I, I think it was out of necessity. Devils do hire, is hiring newer talent who, you know, are enthusiastic and not as expensive. It's also fun to see new talent on G.I. Joe because, you know, in some cases new talent on G.I. Joe years later comes back to G.I. Joe and, and has grown a lot. Um, so I'm going to give this a five. Okay. So uh, next time on Talking Joe Disavowed, we will be continuing our look at the America's elite era of G.I. Joe. We will continue with uh, America's Elite 21 through to 24, which is the Sins of the Mother arc. It introduces new writing and art teams. So uh, very exciting there. When we're not talking about the Devil's Due era of G.I. Joe, we will be covering the latest issues from Skybound as they come out. Um, A Real American Hero from Larry Hammer and the Energon Universe. We'll also uh, you know, be dropping all sorts of uh, other interesting things here and there 
besides that um, if you want to find out more about us you can visit us on our website talkingjoe.co.uk is the website to visit it links to places like our facebook group uh, so join in there and get involved in the discussion we're on twitter so follow us there for all the latest news on instagram where we'll post pictures uh, basically the same thing as twitter really and you can also leave us uh, voice notes at the bottom of our web page uh, to give us your thoughts on the latest issues uh, we are on patreon patreon.com slash talking joe so a big thanks to all of our backers richard sam jay bill christopher justin rob shane ryan simon chris joe craig and our latest member frank who are all getting early access to episodes as well as some exclusive content. Tim, where can people find you when you are not talking to me about G.I. Joe? Uh, my partners and I post video essays on TV and film at our YouTube page, which is at Atomic Abe. I have a brick and mortar comic book store outside of Boston. That's Hub Comics. And I post about G.I. Joe at my blog, a realamericanbook.com. Very good. So I think that is us done for another week. So until next time, remember that Nobody Meets Talking Joe, an international podcast. Laters.